Today's episode of Bump to Business Owner is proudly sponsored by Accountant She, the disruptive, holistic, and person centered accounting team helping to take you from bump to business owner and beyond. From fully outsourcing your business finances to strategic and enhanced maternity planning, we've got you covered. And if you don't need an accountant just yet, but want completely free, accessible, consumable financial education, then you can find me everywhere that you consume content at accountant underscore she. Hello, I'm Caroline Marshall and welcome to Bump to Business Owner, the podcast speaking to mums in business, you. I'll be in conversation with some of the most inspiring women and mothers in enterprise about their journey, how they created their successful businesses alongside raising their children, and what that looks like in work and family life. Hello and welcome to today's episode of Bump to Business Owner. I am your host, Caroline Marshall, and today I am welcoming Lauren Ingram, founder of Women of Web3. When Lauren found she was newly unemployed from her role in tech and on maternity leave, she needed a new plan. She decided to upskill by learning about all things Web3, blockchain, and the metaverse. And while she discovered a burgeoning area of emerging tech, she was shocked by the lack of women in it. Since launching Women of Web3 in 2022, they have grown into a global community of over 20k women and curious minds to learn about emerging tech together. Women of Web3 have partners with the biggest name in tech, consulting, luxury and more, including Google, Amazon, Cartier, Charlotte Trilbury and Shiseido, in order to educate and bring equity and accessibility. I encourage you to learn more about her and head over to YouTube once you are done with this episode, of course, to hear Lauren's TEDx talk on how to build a better internet. Oh, and the one and only Stephen Bartlett counts himself as one of the many fans of what Women of Web3 are doing. If there is any podcast you listen to, please make it this one where Lauren will be talking about why we need to be aware of the lack of women in the tech space. Lauren, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. That was um, that was really nice hearing all my achievements shared back to me. Such achievements. And I'm sorry you have to <laughs> shout out about Stephen Bartlett if he's a fan of yours <laughs> at the start. <laughs> you know, got to get those connections somewhere and join the dots. But um, now I saw you talk on a panel for Female Founders Rise. And I was like, I have to bring her on. We have to talk about all of this because um, naturally my head always goes into if there's a lack of women in something, I always wonder, is it the motherhood? Because we had a little conversation before this about it not just being a gender pay gap so much anymore but perhaps the motherhood penalty lending into this and I and I'm excited to really delve into that today okay. and so I love I love hearing about women moms out there making a change which you certainly are um what's your career path that led to this tell us a little bit about that of course um it's been a little bit mixed uh, in fact even recruiters have asked me in the past like why have you jumped about so much and I think I might have had shiny object syndrome. Um, I also think maybe earlier in my career, I, I probably wasn't the best at, I guess, at my job. And I did find it slightly harder to hold down jobs in, in the early days. But I've sort of uh, jumped about between things like dig digital agencies, tech startups, all the way from um, tiny little four person businesses, all the way up to Meta when it was Facebook. Um, that was, I think that was about 70,000 people ish when I was working there. Wow. What um, was that like? Um, I loved it, actually. Um, I mean, I think partly because of the free food. I mean, I am a sucker for it. <laughs> <laughs> I love your honesty. <laughs> I'm probably not meant to say that. It's the people. Actually, I, I did. Girls I did got really... to eat in London, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they did have amazing food though, but um, but I've I've always really enjoyed being at the at the sort of edges of, or I guess the sort of intersection of new technologies and what you can do with them. Uh, some creative stuff that I wouldn't call myself a creative but I think somewhat creative person um, and then also thinking about women and inclusion um, and so when I was working at Meta my my job actually was running something called She Means Business like a training program for female entrepreneurs several other programs like it so I did actually manage to make uh, women and inclusion part of my job which I didn't even realize was possible um, I mean that that was also the job that I lost when I found out I was pregnant so it was uh, ah, yeah, tricky yeah, uh, yeah they, didn't, irony. they didn't actually know that um, uh -huh. They didn't know that I was pregnant when uh, my yeah my contract was coming to an end. Um, you could only renew it a certain number of times. So that was kind of according to their rules. Um, and I didn't manage to go permanent initially 
partly because it was a tricky jobs market. And then mm. as I found out I was pregnant, I think I was just giving off more and more desperate vibes. Um, and uh, so, yeah, d- didn't manage to go permanent there and didn't manage to get a job elsewhere. And so ended up taking a totally different route. And was this in 2020 as well? So was this in lockdown, like you were job hunting, in which case, understandably, very hard time to job hunt as well? It was about a year into the pandemic. So there was just still, um, it's kind of hard to remember what happened when during during those so yeah. that year or two, but um, there was still a lot of uncertainty around things like, you know, is there budget to bring on like basically new permanent roles in whatever mm. team. And so anywhere I was interviewing, you might then find out like, oh, actually that's being pulled because budgets are changing because yeah, everything was moving and changing so fast. So um, it yeah, it wasn't a great time to be interviewing. And I think I um, definitely, yeah, sort of lost a sense of myself and and what I was good at. So like if, mm. if previously, you know, prior to all of this, I think I would have been more confident in talking about my skills in sort of marketing, PR, running big events, community building and things like that. And then I feel like I, by um, by losing my job and then interviewing for, I checked my spreadsheet beforehand, I interviewed for, or well, applied for, sorry, 106 jobs. Um, that was from- Did you interview for 106? No, I think I interviewed for about, uh, maybe about 25. Wow. Um, and I had something like, 60 interviews in total um you know get down to like the last yeah. two and then it just it just wouldn't come off um so yeah it was quite a demoralizing time um mm. but actually ultimately I'm genuinely glad because if I had managed to go go permanent in a big tech company on a juicy salary I wouldn't have then left to start my own business um I don't think I would have had the sort of the confidence or the impetus to go and carve my own path I hard agree on that because I was made redundant and then went to a job, then furloughed. And I was like, okay. And it was lockdown and I was pregnant as well. And I was like, yeah. Mm. Okay, sometimes you just need to take the hint that you're meant to be doing this on your own. And and not all of us are meant to jump. I have real respect for people that actually jump and go for it versus Mm. ones that are like, okay, this has happened. I need to make the best of it and um, see what I can come up with. And I love that you've spoken about the, I think it was in your TED talk, what, what I was watching with you, the gut wrenching fear about um, going to going to work while like losing your job while pregnant. And I found that so relatable as well, because I was so fearful. I think I felt not to trust my employer at the time when I became pregnant and that it would change everything. And I just thought like, perhaps that similar experience, was it lockdown or is it just something we go through that realization of like, everything I've been working towards is now going to change and I'm pregnant. Yeah. I mean, it is a massive shift and I had the same, I guess, mistrustfulness of, of my employer. I didn't tell anyone and anyone that's connected to work in any sense did not tell them I was pregnant. I literally told close friends like my parents. Um, yeah, I kept it uh, very small while I was unemployed because I just felt like any possible almost like leak of that information would jeopardize my chances of a job, which is really sad. Um, Mm. And in fact, even um, at the time as somebody, so she's called Neve, And so she's now running our partnerships for women of Web3. So she has a a day job at Slack and also supports um, women of Web3 in in her spare time. But at that point, she was also a contractor at Facebook slash Meta, um, but sort of contracted for a lot longer than I was. And so she was sort of sending me roles knowing that I was looking for stuff. And because I knew I was pregnant, I hadn't told her. I had this like, oh my God, I felt so guilty towards her of like, oh my God, she almost like shouldn't put me forward for things or like recommend me for things. I really felt that strongly at the time. Whereas now we talk about it of like, I can't believe um, I almost like wanted her to stop recommending me because I was pregnant. I felt like I would, um, you know, I thought I thought she might feel sort of disappointed if she then found out I was pregnant. And then, you know, say say if I managed to get a job that she recommended me for, and then I take maternity leave that that would somehow reflect badly on her, which when yeah. I when I articulate that out loud, it sounds kind of ridiculous. But at the time, it doesn't feel like that at all. It's it is really it is really terrifying. And um, there's there's probably there's, yeah, because there's a, a few things going on why it would be so so scary. Um, you know, part of part of it is that very like um, I guess sort of fundamental human feeling of just like need to go out and provide for my baby child. Yeah. It's um, like you know you can't you can't help it. No, and well, we've, that's those, what we've been told is important. If you've had the privilege of a good education, that's what you've been told is important up until this point 
when you're like, okay, what happens to that now that I've been working on all this time kind of thing and need, bringing in my own money and being independent. And it, I think maybe that's like a point of being founders now is that we can try and support that change. Cause I had that with a team member. I think something happened and they had to tell me they were pregnant quite early and they're like, oh, I didn't think you'd want me to put you put me forward for this client anymore. And I was like, oh no mm. you're still working with them and we'll sort your maternity leave when the time comes in nine months whenever it is you're taking it and I think because we've got to be part we can hopefully be part of that change now to be like well no I still put you forward for work even if you're hoping pregnancy is in your near future or is in your path right now exactly the sort of living living by our values and um, yeah. uh, employing other women in a way that we would love to be employed and, you know, be part of an organization. So um, that, that is literally why you need more women in leadership is because of this uh, shared you know, lived experience. And so being able to be a better leader that can better help other women in an organization accordingly. Yeah, I love it. That, that's the optimistic view that we're going to go down and with it. But I also, so I'd love to talk about how you actually started Women in Web3. And so I really want to talk about what you do and try and not make it seem scary and encourage <laughs> others who might be at a cross paths in their career to look at your industry as a potential job path for themselves. So um, you also said that motherhood was boring in those early stages, which I loved you're so honest about. I think, do you think it was especially boring because of when you did your early motherhood, you couldn't go out and do the whole maternity leave thing? Uh. Yeah, there's, there's probably a mix. I'm trying to remember. Again, it's, it's that like, it's all kind of merged into one, partly because of motherhood and partly because of lockdown. It was all in that same sort of period. So I can't quite remember what happened when, but I do know that I, yeah, I did I did sometimes feel bored with a potato age baby. He was very sweet, <laughs> very beautiful. And obviously I loved him very much. And, and I, should, I, I did, I felt like I did do fine on the kind of bonding with my baby, but like there is only so much they can give back when they can't do anything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, we know um, that <laughs> you know, so yeah. we love them but it is like you know hold which is lovely when you've got yeah say other kids running around and you don't want to be doing too much but when you're on your own that's um could be quite a lonely time or a strange time yeah so I mean I was I watched quite a bit of Sex and the City and Gossip Girl but I also <laughs> Gossip Girl oh, brilliant <laughs> I did too yeah <laughs> but um but I did find that I just needed a bit more stimulation somehow of like, um, I was, you know, you're, you're kind of either changing nappies or walking in circles in the park to send a baby back to sleep or, um, you know, like breastfeeding in the middle of the night. And so you're kind of going a little bit loopy and may or may not be watching Gossip Girl or, you know, sort of turning your brain to mush anyway. Um, so you, um, it wasn't even necessarily about needing to like upskill or like learn something really important. I just hmm. felt like I needed something different of like something that was uniquely for me um that I could yeah whether it was learn about or do you know it, it could have been something like a pottery workshop instead it, it wasn't that in the end it was web3 um which is the kind of next major major iteration of the internet web 3.0 so if, if web1 was basically the, the dawn of the internet and essentially websites web 2.0 was the next major phase of innovation so things like um social media and the sharing economy and basically essentially apps so things like uber airbnb anything that might be an app on your phone that was the next big change on the internet so the third big change is web 3 um, and a lot of that is blockchain based and so things like nfts i'm not going to go into the sort of full jargon of like non-fungible tokens and da, da, da. but um you've got can blockchain you simply based... explain blockchain is there a way you've managed to do that because i've always tried to ask people this about blockchain um can i explain it in a really simple way i can i can try but i will okay. inevitably put some people off anyway <laughs> um <laughs> so uh blockchain is like a sort of decentralized internet and the 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 idea or ambition behind blockchain and web3 more broadly is like can you decentralize uh powers away from the the central decision makers like the sort of facebook's and google's of the world but also central banks and institutions in that sense so cryptocurrency is uh is a, a type of money that operates on blockchain and you don't need a bank to transfer that money you can just do it as a basically crypto wallet to crypto wallet uh without an yeah so no intermediary you can do it basically using code um and uh, yes, it's decentralized, but you can also do that for things like um, you can also use 
black blockchain for things like managing supply chain or owning things like um nfts non-fungible tokens but let's not worry about what fungible means um basically you are owning digital assets and digital items so uh if with something like spotify you're like okay here's the playlist or the music i own but actually you don't own any of that nice. same with netflix we don't own any of those things actually even things that you might download like um a podcast episode onto your phone Apple could then just rescind that at any point. But something like an NFT is, um, because it's recorded on the blockchain, which is a sort of super safe, permanent uh, way of recording transactions, you really do own that item. So if if your token was, it could be a song or it could be um, a piece of digital art, or it might be some some kind of membership to a community, but then you fully own it in the same way as like, if you were to put money onto your mattress, you, you really own that money. It's not in the bank, um, uh, not owned by the bank sort of thing. Um, not hold, held by them so I'm still not sure that's a I'm still not sure that quite answers the kind of what is blockchain but it is a sort of um alternative way uh, that's not centralized a way of running the internet um and I think that's kind of that's part of what got me interested in it there's also the metaverse side of things of like a, a most, more immersive version of the internet so things like virtual reality headsets um and as it turns out also augmented reality which is things like instagram filters that you can put over your face whatever um all of that stuff is all part of this next yeah, major phase or wave of innovation. Um, so the more I learned about it, the more I was like, ooh, this is really cool. Um, mm -hmm. But if, if initially I was partly learning about it, thinking, okay, post-maternity leave, I need a job, obviously. Um, so I was initially learning about it, thinking uh, this can be like my just my new thing and uh, maybe I can try and upskill, try and get a cool new job later. And the more I learned, it was like, no, actually, this is the thing. This is like the thing I need to be in. So, you know, do I need to maybe like go and work for a Web3 startup? Or um, I wasn't even sure what at that point because, um, yeah, my baby was still really little at that point. But um, but yeah, the more I learned, the more it was like, where are the women in this space? Um, it feels quite hostile to women, to be honest, because uh, Interesting. Web3... Interesting. Why do you say, why did it feel hostile in that sense? Well... Uh, I don't know how many crypto bros you've come across, but that there's a couple, there is a, a couple. <laughs> there is a like a um, Web three and and some of this stuff, maybe something like NFT specifically, is kind of at this like crossroads of uh, the the sort of finance bros that have then turned to crypto instead um, mm -hmm. and sort of uh, like obsessed with crypto, and then you also get some of the kind of like Reddit culture of um, you know sort of boys in their basements or gamers some of that culture coming together to this little niche of um, people that are, you know, like buying and selling or flipping NFTs and things like that. And it it can be, well, A, it's full of jargon and uh, acronyms and slang, but it's also some of that slang is, a lot of that is sort of deliberate gatekeeping of like, hey, we know this kind of like special code, we know this really cool technology, you don't know about it and it's our thing, we're going to do really well out of it. Good luck to you, like the rest of you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, it's like gatekeeping it. It's like, yeah. this is ours. We're going to be the successful people in the next stage. The boys are still going to be the ones holding on to this. Exactly. And and actually, some of that stuff is about representation. So if all the people that you're seeing mm -hmm. talking about this stuff are male, um, and actually what we continually hear from our community as, as women of Web3 is that women feel intimidated by a lot of this tech and kind of feel like if, if you are intimidated by the technology anyway, and then you go somewhere and all the voices you hear talking about this stuff are male. You're kind of like, oh, I'm not meant to be here. This isn't um, that sort of environment for me. It wasn't made for me. Maybe I'm just actually, whether it's like not clever enough or like not the right person to be here. And then they sort of check back out. And that that's what I want to, that's what I'm trying to sort of, I suppose, fight with women of Web3 is, so we're, we are essentially a community. We, uh, I guess, a community and a consultancy. So we have um, in-person events in London, hoping to do some um, elsewhere as well. We have uh, and, and online events. We also have learning resources like uh, weekly Women of Web3 podcast, where I, I interview um, sort of interesting female leaders, partly sort of natively from this space. Um, so like Randy Zuckerberg is Mark Zuckerberg's older sister, and she um, has sort of built her whole business around uh, things like NFTs. Very well. um, but, but I also have interviewed a couple of people like um, Martha Lane Fox, who is the co-founder of lastminute.com, because I thought she'd have a really interesting perspective on that kind of web one, two, three of like the kind of, um, yeah, what it, what progress have we made from a tech standpoint, but also what pro progress have we made from a women's standpoint? So, um, so that's been really fun to do that. And I feel like we offer a third thing as our community, and I've obviously completely forgot what it is, 
jobs we also offer we have like a, yes. a jobs board of like if women are interested in web3 um and actually ai as well we're starting to do more and more with ai because that does right. form the next like the next major phase of the internet um so yeah jobs in web3 jobs in ai we're doing more and more of that is like yeah can we educate as many women as possible about this stuff but then also help them actually thrive in it I've got so much else I want to come back especially to the jobs part because I think that'll be so relevant to our community but um, I had so much to say because it's like where do I start but I think it's great from that point because I can heavily relate to and I think many can of like if someone's explaining something and I don't understand it because it's not meant to be because it's not they've not thought about me as a target audience at all I would easily go oh it's my fault it's too clever for me Mm. and I would easily do that and so thank you for being someone who can easily be like no this isn't it we just need to get more of us involved and it's you know more diversity in there and also so something about one two and three because I was seeing loads of stuff about web three last year and I was a bit like oh god what is this what do I need to know now and so web two it's kind of like we didn't even know that that all that change happened apps became a thing we didn't even know it was like a new phase did we and now it's like we're starting to understand seeing new web so where is web 3 starting to happen now or is it something like what's the timeline on this web 3 because that's what i always want to know <laughs> good question um i would say we are entering web 3 the web 3.0 but um but it is still early days i would say that there's okay. there's still not kind of massive adoption that uh, a lot of the sort of web3 proponents were predicting it would be like everybody's using you know digital wallets and blockchain and you know we're in the metaverse every day it, it's not there yet um, <laughs> but i don't think it's that far away and i actually think because of generative ai and things like chat gpt that's accelerated all of it that mm. um you know even just something like a- ai has in- improved the capabilities of things like what can you do on a vr headset you know, like the the graphics on that have um, on, on any headset have like vastly improved in the last sort of two three years and longer. Um, so where are we in progress wise? Yeah, we're not sort of we're not fully in Web three. Um, mm. uh, but actually, some yeah, some of the hype around Web three as a concept has died down a little bit. Um, but but maybe that was needed in a way that like um, not not yeah, not everything can stay hypey the whole time. I think people almost like enjoy rejecting something that's hyped up. Yes, I think, do you think we're entering a phase of that with AI? Um, I actually spoke to someone the other day who um, trains assistants with AI. So it's basically helping, supporting EA is become empowered with AI. Fiona doing great stuff. And she said, I was like, just caught up for the other day, like, how's it going? She was like, it's not moving as fast as she thought. And it was like, I was like, oh, in what way? And she's like, the AI is, but the people aren't. And that oh. was like a really interesting thing because she goes into places. And do you think it's because they're, is a limit of how fast as humans we can move with this stuff so quickly, which was what I was taking away from that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, yeah. I can understand that actually, because um, especially, I suppose the people that I come across a lot in my work are already very curious about tech. They might feel really intimidated by it, but they're certainly in the kind of um, tech curious bucket. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you start actually looking at the general public, there is yeah a lot of fearfulness around this stuff and a lot of reluctance because people don't really want to change. And like, um, you know, they're quite happy as they are, or you know, <laughs> more or less. And um, it is quite scary when, when, so, when, especially when like media headlines are saying this is going to change everything. And like, a spoiler alert, it is actually going to, it is going to change everything. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, it can, yeah, it's it's a lot when you're being sort of shouted at about this like pace of change. So, so I I, I do recognise that. I think, yeah, that yeah, maybe people are slower to start a- adopting. Uh, these technologies than that we might have might have thought but i do think it's got amazing capabilities the, the ai part especially yeah. something like chat gpt as and i just always think of it in terms of like huge organizations it's really hard for them to change quickly like if you just look at banks when starling and monzo came out and all, all the features they could have on their apps that then all the other banks just took ages to bring in because they've got all these functions that make it everything slower Mm -hmm. in that set in that sense so I'm wondering if that also fits that kind of piece as well yeah there's a bit of that I think also with with the example of generative AI and something like chat GPT I think a lot of businesses are trying to work out like what's their AI policy around this stuff because um chat GPT does take on the data that you share with it so if you were to sort of share financial results or basically anything confidential 
you're feeding the the big data machine with that information mm. um so yeah you do need to be cautious and that's why you do actually need some kind of ai policy or ways of interacting with it the tricky thing is you shouldn't sort of clamp down on usage of it completely because people will inevitably just circumnavigate that they'll just like use ChatGPT with their own you know personal login and will probably still share confidential stuff with it so uh it's yeah this, this stuff is kind of coming regardless and you know the, the genie is already out of the bottle so it's so how, how do you yeah. sort of um partly it's mitigate really but out. also i love that <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, partly how do you mitigate for that stuff but it's also about like, how do you make the most of it like you mm. know businesses could be getting a like a major advantage from adopting this stuff yeah no um it, there's cases for both sides and it like you said it's not going anywhere so this is why i've got you on the podcast to help us with this next phase and it's something on top of what you've already mentioned by the fact um it, you know um females could ease women could be left behind when you talked about this um i just immediately go to mothers and i think about the fact despite all the work i do i work with startups and in this world so i go out of my way it's part of my job to be educated on this stuff but i still feel overwhelmed of like when do I have the time to embrace AI every week? This is just another thing on my to-do list. And do you think this could be part of it, of that the mother load is hugely real? And even when someone like me, where it's part of my job to know this stuff and that this is another way to be left behind as mothers are too busy <laughs> running the household still largely as well as working. Yeah, it, it it is a risk. And it is something that we hear from mums in our community quite a lot is the kind of, you know, I'm, I'm interested in this stuff, but I feel like I can't keep up so mm. um I, I would say just kind of try and build it in in the moments you do have I mean with AI especially and something like chat GPT the, I guess the biggest benefit is that once you do get starting using it the idea the the benefit is that you can automate stuff um and it can sort of take some of that thinking work off your plate um mm. so I think that's why it's in, worth investing some time in you don't even need to inv invest much time in I, I I think of it as a bit like incorporating vegetables into your diet like no you don't need to be like having a salad every meal but like make sure you do have some broccoli alongside whatever whatever you know mcdonald's that you're having <laughs> um and uh just trying to build in little bits of it sort of just getting a bit more confident with it is that you know like there are plenty of people that have never opened uh chat gpt never gone on the yeah. open ai website set up an account um for free and just started using it or actually you can even use it through other means without needing I don't think you even need an account if you go if you literally just use um like Microsoft like Bing or Copilot mm. um or um Google Gemini I think you can just basically just start using it if you like yes Google search Google Gemini and start using this tool and just starting asking it questions and like inevitably you'll ask like silly things initially of like uh like it's, it's like giving somebody the internet for the first time or giving yeah. them the ability to google yeah. something you're like oh my yeah. god what am I gonna search? like what you put into ask jeeves when that was yeah it, it, i think of it like that exactly like that um but yeah. like once you've had a sort of couple of little goes like that um then you'll sort of come back to it like a week or two later and kind of like right okay i'm gonna try and take something off my plate with something like meal planning for my family meal planning that was what came to my mind because it's i think that's a great use case for it um, totally train it on what you like to eat and yeah. um what meals you have already and what can it add to them exactly so i i did basically exactly that um uh probably six months ago or so and it's not to say i sort of I, I don't use something like that every day and i don't even use its suggestions every day but it's it's one of those things where like we know when you're just lacking inspiration and you're like can someone just make this decision for me and so <laughs> uh that's what it's good for is that so i just sort of you know typed in this is what um this is what I like to eat. This is what my toddler does and doesn't like. Um, you know, like refuses to eat this, refuses to eat this, but we're trying to make sure he has some protein, he's not a big meat eater, you know, just all of those like variables, which is a sort of treat it like a sort of brain dump of like, here's everything about our weird eating habits, like, you know, uh, me, my child, and my partner, but what we do and don't want to eat. And also, can you make sure it's not too much cooking and not also not too expensive at the supermarket, whatever? You can just, you know, tell her all the variables you care about or like we don't eat dairy on our house, whatever it is. Um, mm. And then just, you know, like tell it to give you some ideas or say, okay, come up with a, a week's worth of uh, meal planning and know that it's always going to be ready break for breakfast or whatever it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> just plug all of that stuff in. And um, uh, I realize I'm making it sound like there's, you need to be spending lots of time doing this stuff. Uh, lots of it will be just a one-off of like, sometimes all you want is that bit of inspiration and then you can sort of go into your 
um, essentially like a sort of chat GPT account and scroll back to, okay, toddler meal planning that had some useful ideas. And so just kind of going, going and returning to that stuff is actually a bit easier than something like Googling where that information just kind of disappears Definitely. into the ether. <laughs> and it definitely could give you like a shopping list from that as well, I'm sure. Yeah. So that would be easier as well, which Google wouldn't necessarily kind of thing if you go on uh, exactly good foods to get it yeah. wouldn't necessarily give you the list for that so that is a really helpful use case so, and say you're on the other end of the spectrum you're so interested you're like I, I need to change career could this be a career for me and they've gone to the women of web3 job boards and everything like that how do you think because I is it a more of a I can't imagine pivoting I didn't I, I started a business on what I knew <laughs> and so how can someone get that confidence to pivot into the tech space Ooh, um, that is a good question. And part of it will be just getting confident with the tech itself. Um, and actually a lot of it, you really do not need to be technical at all, especially when talking about AI, because you talk to it in natural language. Like we, you know, you talk to it like a human speaks. You don't need to even do it like you do on a Google search of like toddler meals minus broccoli minus blah, blah, which is like a not how we actually speak. Um, <laughs> um, so um, in, t in terms of getting the confidence to go and do it, I would say, yeah, keep keep testing it out. Um, uh, try to sort of think outside the box as to what some of those roles might be. That like it might not even have AI in the job title, but actually a lot of say marketing roles might actually require a lot of um, yeah, not necessarily not necessarily prior AI knowledge, but certainly to make use of it in the role. So you know, be searching that on on LinkedIn, but also. Um, uh, if you're thinking about using it in your business, it's basically like, okay, what would I like to automate? Would I like to make this stuff um, actually like core to my business model? Because it, it it might not be. It might just be that you want to do exactly the thing that you were going to do, but you're going to sort of just turbocharging it using emerging tech. And I think probably especially AI, if you are like a solo founder, it can be really useful. It, it's kind of like, um, actually, if, if you were to give AI to your VAs uh, or VA or VAs, that would just kind of, uh really increase the sort of capacity of what you can get done in that time exactly that, um, it, it's yeah, here to might... get us to do things quicker and take on more clients or support yeah. our clients in a different way i see it as from the va side of things yeah and actually the other thing about um ai particularly probably less uh, web3 less so but um ai is um it's so all pervasive that it's basically kind of like the internet so you don't necessarily see like head of ai roles you, you do see some but i think that will end up seeming weird in the same way as you wouldn't have like head of internet roles it like the internet affects everything <laughs> like digital affects everything um so it would just so get soaked up in tech and or it like those sort of roles basically yeah but it's but it's not even like it, yeah this stuff is or anyone's it yeah 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 exactly yeah. so um it's yeah, I think it's probably like looking at what's the passion that you have or the problem you want to solve and then thinking could or how could emerging technologies help support that and like help me basically achieve that vision. That like um uh I saw someone share this morning on on LinkedIn, um, talking about how they tried to build a business that was a sort of I think it was almost like a sort of hub of inclusion knowledge. They'd spent like two years trying to build this. Um, and, you know, until a few years ago and hadn't really managed to do it and had dissolved the company. But then she had like taught herself conversational AI um, or generative AI. I think both quite, um, quite, quite remember. Um, and that um, in the space of four weeks, she's built this kind of minimum viable product that she's got a sort of like interactive you know, hub of uh, knowledge about uh, about inclusion. And I just think that's really interesting that um, yeah, the, the way we can yeah speed up what we're doing. And yeah, she's answering the same problem but just using a, a different tool, a different methodology. And what's interesting about that, because that's what I find super interesting, it separates the people that also know what they're doing versus not. So like um, I got OpenAI to help me write a trial, new uh, to redo the trial tasks I set my potential team members. I knew exactly what I wanted to test them on and how to do it. I just wanted to like get rid of the writing it part of it. So obviously there's lots of editing and we did work, me and the AI worked together on it, but someone could have gone into AI and been like, this is what we want. I want to do this test and let's pull it. And you can tell the difference between the AI working with someone who knows what they want and knows what they're doing versus someone mm -hmm. who's just pulled it from AI. I think mm -hmm. that's the clear difference, isn't it? Yeah, I, I would consider using AI as like having either an intern or 
um I suppose some, someone very junior on your team which is like yes they might they might be like really smart and they can come up with loads of great stuff for you but you wouldn't just take their work and like present that directly to a client or um you know there, there is still that kind of vetting process and the back and forth and like improving on it um yeah like if, if an intern did pr provide a whole sort of presentation deck for a client you wouldn't then just like just present that deck without the, I hope the some sort of people would <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's the scary part I've worked with somebody who would <laughs> <laughs> oh my god um it is worrying isn't it but then <laughs> yeah but, I think but... that's it we wouldn't but some people would <laughs> yeah well um but I, th I think that's that those are with the same people that you can see that they've got AI generated yeah. work. They're like there is there is a certain way of writing that for me, I think because I see this stuff all the time, um, I sort of work in this stuff, to me it's like incredibly obvious when something is written by AI. Yeah. Um uh like partly I start to see it with inbound, outbound emails now. I can tell. Oh yeah. It's yeah. kind of gross, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because because email is meant to be like by a person. Um is yeah, it's supposed to be. But um but yeah, you can sort of see it with things like actually, even if you sometimes notice like American spelling slipping into people's like LinkedIn posts or emails, yes. and you're like, you yes. have not written this yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah, that it's it is interesting because I think that's where you can start. Yeah, you can start to see it now, and uh, people get caught out on it. So it's like it's a useful tool, but don't think you can just set up a whole business doing that. Yeah. Yeah. What's your favorite tool to use as a founder? Um, I feel like I sound like I'm sponsored by ChatGPT, but I really do use it quite a lot. <laughs> you should definitely reach out to them for your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, um, I, I, I do use it a lot, actually. And, and in fact, I have been increasingly testing Google's equivalent called Google Gemini. Yes. Um, and that doesn't has give me better answers, actually. Um, or, Is it better than Bard? Because I used Bard a little bit, which um, was the one before Gemini. For anyone who doesn't know that yes um uh it is it is better sort of a, a sort of improvement upon it um but uh I, I, haven't, I haven't used it loads and so i couldn't give particularly amazing answers but it, it for me it feels a bit less noticeable that kind of ai way of writing yeah. um so um yeah I, I i do use it a lot I, I don't i don't think i use ai every single day and also on the web three point i don't use things like a crypto wallet every single day um but i do think you will see more and more of this technology is just being kind of like seeping into our daily digital lives. Um, but uh, chat GPT, I probably use, I think probably like every other day or maybe like every three days, because there's sometimes just something you want to like solve or uh, yeah. as, as you were kind of making reference to earlier, sometimes you just don't want like a blank sheet of paper. You want just like something to then work with or edit or a starting point um, yeah. rather than just looking at my blank sheet of paper and thinking. It's a starting point. Yeah. I really need that. And I think yeah. that's what's so handy about these things is like, okay, even if you reject the starting point, which I do sometimes. <laughs> and um, back to like the women getting left behind, I do think it's important to note because you said, is it something like nine out of 10 Web3 startups still have no female representation? Is that right? And sorry? Uh, yes, they have uh, yeah. no, uh, nine out of 10 Web3 startups don't have any women on the co-founding team. So wow. uh, yeah, and and I, I do find that worrying. Um, so that that data is from probably a couple of years ago. We I, we don't have kind of uh, more up to date data on that. But um, yeah, Web three and AI are both pretty poor showing in terms of um the number of women in leadership, which which I do find worrying because um, but but there is also still an opportunity to to shift that to to shape what's coming next because if you start having uh more women in leadership, whether it's um whether they are the ones starting the business or they're being brought on as a co-founder or in leadership in whatever sense, it will also start building with women in mind. The, the, yeah. the tech products that are being built, especially we built with women in mind. Um, and then you start sort of attracting more female users um, and then start attracting more female leaders or you know, employees. All this stuff becomes this uh, virtuous circle or virtuous cycle of, um, yeah, re representation is incredibly important in that sense of, um, because you know it's, it's what ideas are in the room and that's that's also why you know fewer women are being funded is that a lot of the a lot of investors are are male and can't necessarily identify with these uh you know challenges that we're looking to solve and so they're kind of like oh does that really need solving oh well, yes it does for yes. actually 50 percent of the population yes it does <laughs> and financially it works out because 50 percent of the population will buy it <laughs> yeah. kind of thing um, I, I, and... I, I do uh, sorry i was gonna say no I, I do see um when if if like startups or businesses can't necessarily see the moral 
need to to make these kind of changes i think they should see the commercial need of like if you would like the other 50 percent of the population to care about your product and buy it um then that's why you need to sort of bring women into building it um mm. so yeah but if you don't do that then you are leaving money on the table yeah it's sad that's why i mentioned you know in fact 50 percent of women buying it because that's sometimes the way we have to we have to bring it as the back to the commercial sense of it not just mm -hmm. the it's the right thing to do sense mm -hmm. of it and um because like I was also thinking about startups and then if you have female leaders in there then perhaps they'll actually think about things like maternity leave because the amount of startups that seem really unfemale friendly to just work at if they haven't even thought about that side from the start yeah um actually, I don't I don't have data around this part but just knowing what I do know about startups you do get a lot of uh, young men starting startups, especially, sorry, say tech startups. Um, and there's nothing wrong in and of itself. It's just that, yes, they don't have that lived experience of starting a family and certainly not of probably being pregnant. Um, so they're just not building that in. And they're kind of thinking like, oh, but we're, you know, we're bootstrapped. We don't want to be sort of spending the money on paying someone that's not physically, um, you know, actually working that day. Um, so, so I can understand the kind of reluctance or fearfulness around it but actually it's it's so important that like um to to welcome women into the workforce and so you do need things like maternity policies and um uh i have heard from from lots of women as I'm, it sounds like you have as well who have they've been like the first person to get pregnant in their whole company and so that was actually me <laughs> oh really oh my god okay yeah. so there was no policy in place yeah i think that's i think that's quite common actually and it's oh it's it's doubly rubbish because you, you basically have to you have to sort of fight harder to just kind of show what is necessary or decent etc but you're also essentially doing that on behalf of anyone that might get pregnant after you so you're kind of mm. having to like fight other people's fight as well um so that's a lot of pressure if you're um you know you're, yeah the first person to get pregnant in the company anyway and yeah there's there can be a sort of real lack of sometimes a lack of empathy but but certainly less of lack of understanding yeah, and even if they're like trying to do the right thing at first and it's like, oh, we want yours to be the flagship pregnancy. It's a bit like that. That's a lot on me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. I, all I did was, you know, decide to grow a human being and now I'm representing all the next human beings in this workforce kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it's a fascinating world because just because I've been in it and know it, just to talk about the awareness of like, companies start up and just don't have these things in place and it's obviously there'll be a whole host of other policies as well not in place but in the context of this podcast it's um just another way of getting women into this field is by being more inclusive with your policies and having them in place to start with kind of thing and on that so how has it been for you growing women of web3 while you've been growing a small human i um has it's obviously your passion. I think sometimes my learning is you make peace that if something's your passion, you've got to do that as well. Yeah. I mean, um, I did get a little bit ticked off by my partner for how much I'm using my phone and laptop at the moment. Um, but I think it's one of those things where I've allowed myself to use that stuff all the time because I'm like, oh, but this is actually where I get opportunities from. If I'm like posting on LinkedIn, I end up getting paid opportunities, getting business in the door. So uh, I sort of legitimize it that way, but I'm also probably telling my toddler what I care about in terms of what I'm spending my time interacting with so that, that part does slightly worry me oh, but, um, we all have that challenge I think whether it's your work or you're not if you're spending too much time on your phone around your kids and what you're mm. representing to that yeah um but in terms of my own I guess working setup I only have three days a week of childcare. um I do have a partner he like he does um he probably does more of the at home stuff than I do like he does you know more oh, of the wow the cooking and stuff so I, feel like, I was gonna say I was really lucky but then also that no my couldn't... husband does the cooking and I feel like why should it might no no men are walking around saying they're so lucky their wives cook <laughs> I mean <laughs> exactly, maybe some exactly. are <laughs> yeah um exactly that so I, I I try not to say it too much about they're like oh I'm so lucky but yeah that, that's the kind of standard I would hope for for lots of women to have partners that sort of do the stuff equally or do maybe do all of the cooking whatever it is so can I just I suppose... appreciate we used an example of cooking earlier and neither of us cooked <laughs> yeah I was just I was just pretending yeah. uh, just pretending I cook <laughs> I love that um, um but 
so yeah a supportive partner who's sort of like physically present a lot of the time because he's also freelance so we do have to do quite a lot of like choreography in fact I mean yeah. I, I know that like parents relate to this generally that like your relationship a lot of it is just organizing stuff of like you know whether it's play dates or like getting in touch with or like you know sorting out um what's it even called like you know tax-free childcare and whether we're eligible for the 15 hours 30 hours blah 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 blah, blah. I mean um, that's a full-time job that doing that yeah <laughs> so um it's, it's yeah it's not particularly romantic um that you know a lot of our conversations with our partners mm. are about stuff like this or yeah or meal planning anything like this um but yeah I suppose I, I do feel lucky in my setup however some things that I obviously can't do everything if I'm, if I'm working three days a week um I did actually say a couple of months ago to my partner I was like okay so I've got 12 working days a month if our toddler does not get a temperature like like <laughs> if a two-year-old does not yeah. get a temperature then I've got an like you know officially 12 working days and actually yeah a yes he does get a temperature because he's two um and so like it's and probably more like nursery is he during those three days a week so yeah yeah well like, uh, yeah a childminder with yeah, a bunch of other little snot bags um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, true. so um so yeah maybe I get like yeah 10 or 11 days if I'm lucky of, of working days and I was like oh that's why I feel like I'm always really behind on like my emails, my work. Like if I was, if I was feeling, you know, everyone always feels like behind on their stuff, but it was like, oh, okay. If I've got about 10 working days a month, no wonder I feel like I'm really behind and like I'm sort of failing to do the stuff. But, yeah. um, but no, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm sort of making peace with that. And, and actually, I'd, so I even sort of uh, stepped away from uh, one like business opportunity. So I had, had been, I had started another second business with, with a friend as a co-founder and um and that was it was fun that was exciting but I also felt like I was doing a lot of like apologizing of like you know sorry either my toddler's got a temperature so I can't sort of come to our meetings or um or it might be that you know for women of web3 we were holding like a big international women's day event that like, all that stuff is um it can end up being all encompassing and so I'll be like oh sorry I can't work on my the other stuff at the moment while everything is mm. so all encompassing with my first business and I was starting to get things like um I forgot what they're called, um, like the beginnings of like migraine aura where you can't like basically you can't entirely see out of for me. For, oh, my for goodness. So um, so it was just kind of like li- recognizing things like yeah. that. Like it never got really bad, but I was like, that's but a I sign for you. Yeah, it was also like I don't want it to get really bad before I then make a change. <laughs> so, um, yeah, something's got to give. So I've either got to spend less time on that or I've got to spend less time with my kid. So it's it's less time on the, on the other business then so I've um so I am yes stepping away from that to just focusing only on women of web3 and and a young family and like no other massive commitment <laughs> I love that that shows you know you had to make a sacrifice and and that was your choice and it is about choices and sacrifices with these things and so you're three days a week you fully on the business and two days fully mummy day um or is I, would that like it, I would like it to be as um <laughs> as well delineated as that um and actually I think some of it's like poor organization on on our part that like it it would be better if we were actually quite strict about that of like you know this is your day or your half day whatever and it's it's quite a lot more um free flowing than that which in one way is lovely and another way we're really (laughs) not doing ourselves any favors um so yeah three days officially my mum also helps out um one morning a week but then um, I, there'll be plenty of other listeners that sort of recognize this, that you're also kind of having coffee together at the beginning of that, you know, three, four hours, and then maybe also making the, like the kid meal at the end of that uh, period. And so actually I'll probably get about, yeah, two hours, maybe an yeah. hour and a half, maybe an hour if they're at the park or something. Um, look, sorry, I sound really un- ungrateful. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, I, I hard I'm... relate to that. Yeah. No. <laughs> but, um, well, I, I suppose that, you know, if, if you're, if it's like a family member or someone close to you that's looking after your kid, then you're also to some extent looking after them um that you know that it's also a kind of a socializing opportunity so um so yeah I, f- I feel very lucky with my setup but yeah there's probably like an hour and a half or two hour, two hours extra per week in terms of mm. childcare that I have um so uh so I've forgotten the question um but you put it in of doing too much. per month that is you know well just in general about how you're doing it that is not a lot and I think I did the same I think I did three days a week still when my second was around that age and how have you found the fact that 
they are it is more do you feel have you felt as you're still in it in those early years it's more on you being the mother even though you've got you know clearly got a husband admin wise you're very good at splitting stuff which is great um I would say I, I, I'd actually say on on balance I think he actually takes on more than I do but I, I would say that's probably the un, I'm probably the odd one out in that sense like our relationship yeah. is the odd one out um although we do also have habits as to you know I, I think I do more of the kind of administrative side of it in the sense of um I, I don't know like for example earlier when the, the childminder handed my partner the form about the 30 hours free childcare or whatever um, and he looked at it and then was like oh actually I'm just kind of pretending to look at this so like it's obviously going to be Lauren that's what's it <laughs> oh yes here you go yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. sometimes my husband just passes it to me not even pretend <laughs> <laughs> yeah. then I pass in the mortgage form so it's fine <laughs> oh see I, I am on the I'm on the like financial admin side of things yeah I think you just kind of end up with like uh yeah sort of divvying up of one person tends to look after certain things so like oh yeah look yeah. after the bills and things and he looks after the bins and that works well for me Working in a kind of like bro culture, it easily could be. Do you ever feel you've got to explain that you're three days a week or that you don't have all your energy on women of Web3, like a young 22-year-old might on their business? Um, There is a little bit of that, yeah. Mm. Um, I mean, I suppose because I'm not in a bigger organisation, I don't necessarily have to make excuses in that way. Or not, not even excuses, but like um, explain myself in whatever sense. Um, and, and I suppose I do also work with quite a lot of other women because of the nature of my work, but I do occasionally feel like I have to slightly apologize or things like that, or quite a lot of the time I get asked to do speaking opportunities for free. Um, and so I've started either turning them down or actually I tend to qualify it with when I've sort of worked out that it's unpaid and I'll say, would you be able to pay like, you know, hundred, maybe 150 pounds to cover uh, transport and childcare so that and I'll say in the email so that it doesn't cost me money to come and speak at your event and then so there is a sort of sudden like backing up of like oh oh, oh, oh actually I think maybe we can find that 100 pound for you um <laughs> because it, uh, it, it yeah, it, yeah it shouldn't cost me um money as well as my time well it's both right it's um if, mm -hmm. if you're not going to pay me for my time then you should at least make sure it's not costing me money to help make your business money um that uh with, with something I, I noticed it really with um international women's day and i know there was quite a lot of chatter around it at the time that um it was really like financially focused organizations like you know big like banks and payment companies and things like that were asking me to speak at their event and i, I said no to five opportunities and it's, it's kind of hard turning stuff down um but i'm also like i don't really want to uh, like you know if, if they're sort of saying not in these exact terms but they're basically saying we can pay you with ex exposure i'm like well I've got exposure. I'm all right, thanks. <laughs> like, got you know, my, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, also like you know, my mortgage provider doesn't accept that as payment, no. so neither do I. <laughs> Especially when you know there is the funds behind them, and yeah, I saw yeah. the same source of chatter you do. And actually, I've got a lady called Laura Lee who runs a speaker agency that encourages diverse speakers. And yeah, I think we had a conversation on this quite recently, and it is it shows the difference between lip service or like actually wanting more female speakers and paying them kind of thing yeah and thank you for sharing what you ask for because I think that's really helpful for others to be like okay I'm going to start asking for that if I'm not going to be paid at least like cover my child yeah yeah um in fact I, I did feel embarrassed when I actually stated a number I was like oh should I not have stated a number but you're right mm -hmm. it's really helpful context but it's also like a um you'll have a sense in your head of like what the childcare cost is or if it's like an evening event what it costs to have a babysitter yeah. Um, that kind of thing of like, yeah, these companies should help facilitate that anybody could come and participate in this stuff. That's it, because it's not just about, yeah, that asking you to speak for free. It's like they're actually asking you to like pay money to speak if you've got to do it on a day where you'd normally have childcare and you, you're not budgeted for that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. um, thank you for sharing that. That would be so oh, helpful. So, cause... Sorry, just going back to that budgeted yeah. point, it's, it's sort of not it's sort of not relevant whether I had childcare in place. Like they don't they don't yeah. know that or not do you know what I mean like yeah um you know I, I have to pay for childcare, whatever um so yeah like I I should or like we should all be asking for that um that kind of fee regardless if like yeah just just make sure that I'm not worse off as a result 
yes that that's um, a good point and um I'm think I think I'm going to take that away myself so thank you <laughs> good <laughs> yeah it is because I get it from their perspective they're never going to think oh well it's not our fault it's just our child. <laughs> and that's the way they look at these things and um oh Lauren it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you today I'd love to ask one well two final questions what's been your favorite part of your founder journey so far Ooh, I think maybe realizing that I'm allowed to do it um I don't know why I thought that I wasn't allowed but um mm. but I've realized oh I actually can run my own business and I've almost like I feel like I've got away with it which is a bit <laughs> ridiculous but I'm I'm really enjoying it I love that oh thank you and and finally so any have you got three tips learnings direct places to direct people for them to learn more about the web3 world ai crypto and anything they might have been interested in that you do um oh that i do um i would definitely say go i would say go and listen to the women of web3 podcast um and part of the reason i say that is that it is deliberately beginner friendly so i don't let it get too into the kind of jargon and when people do start going down the tech rabbit hole I sort of try and bring them back and say what does that mean like what does that word mean um and actually a lot of the time we're talking about the human impact of tech rather than the like deep tech um so go and listen to the women of web3 podcast um I would say if you're London based come or sort of um in the in the south of England uh, come to one of our women of web3 events we just had, we had a big event at Google recently and I'm hoping we're hopefully going to do more of those and more sort of essentially meetups um at Google and other locations like that and then something that's nothing to nothing of my own but I would say that people should go and test chat GPT or other equivalent products because it's either very cheap or free to do so and I think as soon as you start you just have to sort of rip the plaster off in that sense start using this stuff make it makes it feel less scary and you realize you're, you're talking natural language with with AI like that and so um and it can really help you do do more sort of automate more of your life whether it's your home life or um make it easier to do your job and the automate things you don't want to do love that thank you so it's like rip the plaster off and check out women of web3 community and podcast i think that's <laughs> such easy takeaways that busy people can do and um where else can they find you lauren um if they want to find out more um best place probably linkedin so i'm yeah i'm lauren ingram on linkedin i've got a little yellow background behind my head if you're looking for me <laughs> lovely well thank you so much for your time today it's been an absolute pleasure to learn more definitely but also chat about your motherhood and founder journey so thank you thank you so much for listening to bump to business owner i hope you enjoyed the conversation Please do rate, review, follow or subscribe wherever you're listening. It really helps us to connect with more mums and business owners. You can DM me on at Bump to Business Owner on Instagram and I'll be back next week.